Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to my Affinity Photo Crash Course. In this video, I want to take you from being an absolute beginner and knowing nothing at all about Affinity Photo to giving you the confidence to create your very first project. So once we first launch Affinity Photo, you will be presented with this welcome screen in front of you here. And all this is, is just a little bit of information on different products they offer, such as Affinity Publisher or the iPad version of Affinity Photo and just various other little bits and pieces. We also have some video tutorials and some ways of contacting them if you need support. So as of today's recording, we are in October 2021 and the current version is 1.10. However, anything you learn in today's video will be relevant to any future releases. So all we need to do now to get started is just come down here to the right hand side and we just click that new document right there. So after selecting that new document, we'll be presented with these templates in front of us and we've got all different various sizes. If we head up to the left hand side, we'll start off in the top left hand corner on my presets. And inside of here are going to be all the canvas sizes that you create and save yourself. So custom. Next to that, we have the print presets and we have various different sizes in here from A0 to A10 or various other different sizes for print. Next to that, we have the press ready. And this is generally the same thing as print, so it doesn't really matter which one of those that you choose. Next to that, we have photo. And inside of here, we have presets for different sizes, such as your 8x10 or your 8x6, which can be really useful if you have any of these size photo frames lying around your home and you want to print to that specific size. So next to that, we have the web. And inside of here, we have sizes such as the full HD which is going to be really good for creating YouTube thumbnails. That is your perfect size right there. Over here, we have the QFHD, which is 4K. So this would be really good if you are creating content for maybe video, as well as also having presets for a CD album cover, if you're creating that kind of thing, and social media posts, if you are posting anything to Facebook or Twitter, etc. So next to this one, we have devices. And inside here, we have all different sizes for the iPad Pro and the Kindle, etc. And these are really good if you are creating mock-ups for any of these devices. So next to that, we have architectural. And inside of here is where you'll find sizes for creating blueprints or documents of that nature. And just over here to the left, we have this box here that says templates. Inside of here, mine is empty. Yours might not be by default. If yours isn't empty, it's just going to be a few templates that come with Affinity Photo. I generally don't find them very useful, so it's something I've always ignored myself. But you feel free to have a little play around with that. Or alternatively, look online and see if you can download any that you can store in here. But for now, we're just going to go back up to the presets on the top. So we're just going to go back over to the web because this is probably where you're going to start most of the time you start a new project. And I assume you guys will already know the kind of size canvas that you want before you even start. But just to explain things a little bit better, we're just going to select this full HD one here. And then we're going to head over to the right hand side where we've got all these various different options. And we're now going to talk about these. So starting at the top here, we have the page width and we have the page height. And these numbers are dependent on the size canvas that you want. You can simply just select over that with your mouse and type in the number that you want. Or you can double click on that one. Underneath this, we have the DPI. And this is really important if you guys wish to print. If you decide to design anything and you want it printed, your DPI needs to be at 300. Whereas if you're just creating content for web or device, you can leave that DPI at 72. That really isn't important. However, please just keep in mind, if you ever want to print anything and you want the maximum quality out of your photos, then just change that to 300. Okay, so underneath that, we have the document units and we can change this from pixels to points to inches, yards, millimeters, centimeters, etc. And this all depends on how you like to work. For me, I mainly stay in pixels. Then underneath that, we have the orientation. And this is just landscape or portrait. So you decide which way you want this when you begin your project. Then underneath that, we have the actual size zoom. This you can just ignore. It's not important at all. Just leave that as default. Then underneath that, we have the image placement policy. And this is another important one. So inside of here, we have two different options. And at the top, we have preferred linked. And what this generally means is if you drag in an image from somewhere on your hard drive, Affinity Photo will then link to that original location every time that that opens up your project. So the problem with this is if you accidentally delete that image later on down the line from your hard drive, 
and you open up your project, Affinity Photo is going to come up with an error telling you it can't find that file. So my personal recommendation is that you just leave it as prefer embedded. And what this will do is if you do the same thing, you just drag in an image from anywhere off your hard drive. When you choose prefer embedded, it will actually take a copy of that image and it will store it inside of your document or your project. Meaning if you do accidentally delete any images later on down the line and you open up the project, you're always going to have access to it because it's made a copy inside of there. So I hope you understand what I meant by that. But just to make it simple and just to save any future headaches, just leave it as preferred embedded. So underneath that, we have our colors in here. And this is another important one. If we are working for web or device, you want to have this in RGB. However, if you are deciding to print anything, you want to change that to CMYK. And the reason for this is CMYK and RGB have different color ranges. And what I mean by that is if I was to create a document and use RGB and I had a certain shade of blue, for instance, when I go to print that on my printer, that shade of blue may come out a little bit darker or a little bit lighter and may not necessarily represent the color that I originally used. However, if you are printing and you choose CMYK, whichever colors you use inside of CMYK should be the exact same colors that come out of your printer. So once again, if you're working for web or device, then RGB. If you want to print anything, CMYK. And that's all you need to remember with these settings right here. So underneath that, we have the color profile. And this is kind of an outsourcing kind of thing. If you want to send your prints to someone else to print, they will use one of these inside here, at least most of the time. And you can generally find out which one of these they will use on their website or by simply contacting them. But for the most part, you will probably just print from home. So you can just ignore that completely. Then underneath this, we have the transparent background. And all this is, is giving you the option to have maybe a white canvas for you to design on, or you can just have a transparent background where that's useful for creating icons or logos with no backgrounds. This isn't important because you can always change this later on in the project after we made the design anyway. So you make that choice now, whether you want that on or off. I tend to leave it off because I like to work on a white background. So underneath that, we have the margins and all we've got to do here is simply just check that box and decide whatever size margin you want inside of here, which is going to be important if you're creating maybe content from magazine covers and you need your content to stay within a certain boundary box. So that's dependent on what you want to put in there. And finally, if we just go up to the top here, we've got this little custom menu right there with this little round circle and the cross in the middle. And this is a way that we create our own presets. So we'll just assume that you maybe changed all these numbers and you've set it up the way you want your document to be. If you decide you want to use all these same settings later on down the line in another project, all we've got to do is hit that little checkbox right there. And it's just created a new preset for us here. And we can right click on that to rename it. And if you decide you don't want any more, you can right click and delete once again. And you will always find that inside of your My Presets every time you open up Affinity Photo. So I'm just going to delete that because I don't need it. So there is a quick introduction on setting up a document and talking you through some of the different templates that they offer. So if you're ready to get started, we're going to come all the way down to the bottom here on the right hand side. And we're just going to hit that create button. So here we are inside of Affinity Photos interface. And I've already brought in a few images just to speed up the video and show you a few tricks and techniques as we go along with the course. However, when you guys first open up your project, you will just have a blank canvas like that right there. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn that back on. So we're going to begin by talking about these five different icons we've got here on the top left hand corner. And we'll start off with the photo persona. So this is the one we're going to be in by default every single time that we open up Affinity Photo. And we've got a whole different selection of tools inside here which are used for removing backgrounds, changing the way the images look or masking and adding effects, etc. But we'll talk more about that as we go along with the tutorial. So next to that one, we have our liquify persona. And this is generally used if you want to change things about maybe this model here that we have in the image, such as enhance the size of her lips or the, her nose, make her eyes bigger or smaller, move things around, make her slimmer all those kinds of things. So I'll quickly demonstrate how we can do that. But before I go into the liquify persona, we need to come over to the right hand side because by default, this will probably be an image every time you drag something into the program. And what I mean by that, if I just go ahead and double tap this and rename it to just number one, I'll be fine. Next to this one, you can see it says image. 
And this is where it's going to be an issue with the Liquify Persona. If I go up now and I try and open this, it's going to come up with this error. It says, please select a pixel layer or mask before entering Liquify. So what this generally means is that we've got to convert this image to a pixel. And the way we do that is just right click on your mouse and we're going to come down to where it says rasterize. So select rasterize and you can see it's now converted that to a pixel. Then we can go ahead and open up the liquify persona. So as you can see, we've got kind of this grid around her and we just use these points here to move things in. So if we want to make her maybe a little bit slimmer, we can simply make our brush size bigger or smaller by using the left and right bracket keys. You just got to select an area and just hold down on your mouse and start to pull in just like that and just focus on the areas that you want to maybe look a bit slimmer in the image as well as if we want to come up here and we want to make her chin a bit longer we can just drag that and pull it down just like that then if we want to make her lips a bit bigger or her eyes a little bit bigger we can come over here and change the tool on the left hand side if we just go ahead and select this one here which is the liquify pinch tool and we come over her lips here make that brush a bit smaller and we just click and hold down on our mouse and we just watch it get bigger the longer we hold down until you find the size you're happy with so something like that we can do the same on the eyes just make that a little bit bigger by holding down on the mouse button on both of those and we could go ahead and move that nose if you like just by coming back up to this tool we originally had which is a liquefied push forward tool and we just go ahead and just move that if you want and you've got a various different tools in here that do different things, but I'd rather you guys go ahead and experiment with these yourself, as I believe you learn by doing. I just want to give you a quick overview of what this is actually used for. And you'll also notice we've got some other options here on the right hand side where we can change the size of the brush that way and the hardness, etc. All things that I want you to have a little play around with yourself. But once you're happy with the changes that you made, if you go ahead and hit apply, that will finalize what we just did. And looking at this model right now, you can't really tell we've even changed anything. She just generally looks natural like this was the way it always looked. So that is how you would achieve that kind of effect if that's what you're going for. So next to the liquify persona, we have the develop persona. And this is generally used by people like photographers who work with raw files. And I'll just demonstrate that now by coming into one of my raw files, which is right here. This is just an image I took at a friend's wedding. And if I just go ahead and open up the develop persona up here now, you can see we have a different set of tools once again on the left hand side, as well as different options here on the right hand side and different tabs and sides of here that do all different kinds of things. So if you've got any experience with Adobe Lightroom, this is going to be second nature to you. But once again, I don't want to cover too much on this because 90% of you people out there are not going to even know what a raw file is or why it's important. So of course, please check out YouTube for other tutorial videos if you are interested in working on raw files inside of Affinity Photo. But you can just quickly see we've got a few options here on the left hand side, such as the red eye removal tool. If you had a red eye in your image, just simply tap on that and just click on the eye and it will remove it. And then we've got all these different options over here where we can change the exposure if it's not bright enough for you or it's too bright and just get whatever you like out of that image and just change the brightness as well as you can come and change the skin tones and the saturation, make it look a little bit more natural. We could come down and we can change this white balance to give it maybe a brighter day, just like that, more of a sunset kind of thing. And the beauty with working with raw files is it gives you so much more creativity than it is with a JPEG, but that subject definitely is for another video at another time. So after this one, we have the tone mapping persona, and this is generally used for creating HDR content. So if I just go ahead and just hit develop on that so we can just change it and keep it, then we'll come up here and we'll open up the tone mapping persona. And we're just going to wait and it's going to load in it and it's going to bring up a few templates here or presets on the side. And you can get a general idea of what these are used for. So we can just select one of these and you can see we kind of got that really sharp look, almost like a drawing. And that's kind of what HDR is, kind of really high detail kind of photography. This isn't something I use a lot, but of course you can experiment with this and see what you can achieve with that one. And finally, I'm just going to come off that one and I'm not going to save that because I don't generally like it. We'll go over here and now we have our export persona. And inside of here, it's just a way of exporting certain parts of the image that you might want as its own file. So if I just drag out a box here, and I'll drag out a box maybe over his shoe and just over her hand there. 
If I want to save all these three pieces, I can do now just with their own individual files. This is something that you may find you use if you are creating mockups for web designs or things like that, where you need to cut out all the elements and then bring them back together in a new document on a different program. Other than that, this may not be much use to you, but the option is there if you want it. So we're just going to go ahead and go back to the photo persona while we talk about a few of these other tools we have available. So before we go ahead and create some cool content, I just want to talk about the panel that we've got over here on the right hand side. This is called your studio panel, and this is where you find the options for changing colors of certain elements or shapes inside of here. Next to that, we have swatches, which is just another list of different colors that we have inside of here. And we also have a brushes section. The brushes section is going to be a really important one, and we're going to cover that when we talk about masking. So for now, we'll just ignore that. Then underneath that, we have our layers section, and we'll talk about layers as well as we go on in the tutorial. Then next to that, we have the character and paragraph and text styles. These are all kinds of things that you're going to use for formatting text and maybe something we'll cover later on. So next to that, we have the stock section and inside of here, we have two different websites and these websites feature thousands upon thousands of images that have been uploaded from people all around the world. And these images are free to use however you like. All you have to do is just give name credit to the photographer. And you can find that one of two ways. You can either hover over an image and you can see the name right there. Or alternatively, you can drag an image in such as this one there. And you'll get this box just appear up there with photo by that person. And you can simply just note that down and put it wherever you need to place that. However, I'm just going to undo that for the moment because I don't need to use it. But you can see this is where I found the image that we're using right now on our canvas. So if we just go back to our layers for the moment, and then we're going to talk about these options we've got down here as well. We have our mask layer, and this is going to be what we use when we come to mask images later. So we'll talk about that as we do it. Next to that, we have our adjustments. And inside of here, we have all different color adjustments, such as your brightness and contrast, your white balance, your levels, etc. And we'll cover a few of these as well as we go along. Then next to that, we have our effects box. And inside of here, we have different options such as drop shadows and 3D and kind of things you're going to apply to shapes more than images. So we just come out of there for the moment. Next to that, we have our live filters and we can either access them inside of here or alternatively, we could come up to the layer section on the top menu bar and just go down to new live filter. And we have these in there also. So next to that, on the right hand side, we have this option here, which is group layers. So once we have plenty of layers in here and you want to select all of them into one group, we would do that using that button. Then next to that, we have the add pixel layer, which is how we would add a new layer just by simply clicking on that. And if you don't want that, you can, of course, just go ahead and delete it. So underneath that, we have our transform menu. And this is just a way of rotating shapes or images or anything you kind of manipulate or change the X or Y axis of it manually. Most of the time you probably do this with your mouse and not even bother using that, but the option is there if you want to. So next to that, we have our history. And this is generally every step that we've took throughout the whole document since we started. So if you find you want to go back to an earlier point before you change something, you simply got to go and find it and just click on it. So that is a really good feature to have. So moving over to the left hand side, we've got another row of tools. And with this being a crash course, I'm not going to talk about every single one of these tools in a lot of detail, as I feel that's probably far too much information to throw at you as a beginner. So what I will do is generally talk about the ones that are the most important ones and the ones you're going to use 95% of the time when opening the Affinity Photo. And of course, these will be those same tools that we use to manipulate images or remove backgrounds or remove objects from photos. So we'll go ahead and we'll start at the top here with the view tool. All this generally does is move your canvas around into a different position. If you're not happy with where you place that, just hit command or control zero on your keyboard, and then that will reset that for you. Then underneath that, we have our move tool. And this is generally just used for selecting and moving and resizing elements on your screen. So if I just go ahead and grab myself a star and we'll go and select that move tool, you can see we just simply tap and drag on this to move it where we want it. And we can also resize it with the handles on the side and the top. And of course, just hit that delete button if you don't want it. So underneath that one, we have our color picker tool. And this is generally used to sample a color in your image that you may want to apply to another object. 
So if we look over here on the right hand side, you can see our circle here at the moment is white and that one's black. But when we go and sample a color, such as on this lips here, you can now see that it's changed to the color that we just sampled up here. And now we can just go ahead and apply that to a new shape, for instance. And that generally is all that is used for. So underneath that one, we have our crop tool. And all we've got to do with this is simply just drag the area to the size canvas that we want. Just something like that. Hit enter. And then that will resize that canvas for us. If you want to undo that, it's just command or control Z. Then underneath that one, we have our selection brush tool as well as our flood select tool. These essentially are the same thing, but are used in different scenarios. So the selection brush tool is going to be what we use to cut around an image like this. If we want to focus where there's more detail, whereas we will go ahead and use the flood select tool. If we maybe wanted to remove a sky or something with a large area and not a lot of detail. However, a majority of the time you are going to be using the selection brush tool as I feel it's generally better anyway. So underneath these ones, we have our rectangular marquee tool. And inside of here, we've got some other shapes. They all essentially do the same thing. We also have the freehand option here where we can just draw our marquee just like that. And if you want to get rid of that, hit command or control D, which is what you use to deselect. So we generally would use this if perhaps we want to make a copy of a certain part of the image. So if we just make sure that we are on the image of the girl over here on the right hand side in the layers and we just draw out a square marquee here. If we want to make a copy of this now, it's just a simple case of hitting command or control C, which is copy and command and control V, which is paste. And if we look in the layers now, you can see we've got the copied version that we just created. And if we just go ahead and grab our move tool and we move that out of the way, you can see what we've actually just done there. So we can just go ahead and delete that and just hit that command or control D to deselect. Then underneath that one, we have our flood fill tool. This is something I'm not really going to cover in this tutorial as it's mainly used for coloring in pixel art. If you're an illustrator, that's something we're not going to cover in this tutorial. So we just skip that for now. But of course, feel free to go on YouTube and check out any other videos regarding that tool. So underneath this one, we have the gradient tool. And this is really straightforward to use. If we just go ahead and grab ourselves a shape and we just drag that out. And if we select that gradient tool, all we've got to do is just come down from either a corner or top from bottom and just drag that straight across. And you can see we now have two different colors in here and we can change these colors by tapping on that and just change it in the color wheel just over there. And we select the other color and just give that a different one over there too. And we can also add additional colors by tapping anywhere on this line and giving them their own individual colors also. Alternatively, we can also do this in this menu up here on the top left hand side. But inside of here, we have some additional options such as changing the type or moving the midpoint or changing the opacity on any of these points inside of here, as well as reversing the gradient. And you can also come in at any point and just remove this gradient or reassign it to a different location or move that around however you please just by dragging that around. And that generally is all you need to do in terms of using the gradient. So we just go ahead and delete that one as well. So underneath that one, we have the paintbrush tool. This is one of those tools that we're going to use most of the time when you're inside Affinity Photo and you want to do photo manipulation. We use it alongside masking, which is a way of hiding and showing certain parts of the image. However, this is something I'm actually going to demonstrate in a project during this tutorial. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. So underneath that one, we have the paint mixer tool. Once again, I'm not going to bother covering this in this tutorial as I don't feel it's relevant to you right now as a beginner. So underneath that, we have the erase brush tool. And this is something you use alongside the paintbrush tool. If you want to erase anything that you created, and we'll talk more about that as we go on as well. So underneath that one, we have the dodge brush tool. And inside of here, we have some additional options, which we have the burn brush and the sponge brush. The sponge brush isn't one that you probably use often. So the main two you do want to focus on are the burn brush tool and the dodge brush tool. And what these generally do, if we focus on the dodge brush tool first, this is used for creating highlights on an image. So if we just go ahead and make sure that we are clicked on the go on the layer section, and if we just focus on the right hand side here and we just start to draw around her face, you can see that we're starting to get lighter on one side of her face. And the more we go over this, the more lighter it's going to get. And that generally is how you create a highlight. And the same thing goes if you want to do a shadow, we just got to change that then to the burn tool. 
and the exact same principle just start drawing down the other side of the face and of course you can make these brushes bigger or smaller with your left or right bracket keys as well as change a few settings up here on this top left hand menu bar such as the opacity if you want to make that a little bit lighter or the hardness so it's a bit softer around the edges or it's harder this is just a case you having a little play around with these and see what you can do but in a nutshell that is the dodge brush and the burn brush just to create highlights and shadows so underneath that one we have the clone brush tool and this generally is used for cloning an area to hide a different area like an imperfection such as maybe this little blemish down there if we just zoom in here so we can focus on that we've got that right there i'm just going to shrink that so you can see what i'm focusing on just here and if we want to now get rid of that we're going to go ahead and grab that clone tool and we've got to hold down option or i think it's alt on a pc and we get this little crosshair when we do that and what we're going to do is find an area close to that that looks very similar to the skin tones so such as that bit right there so once we select that we can let go of it and then we can come over there and just click on there and now as you can generally see if we zoom back out it's hidden that as though it was never even there so this is a tool that is quite good but there is a better way of doing this and i'm going to demonstrate that as we're going in the tutorial so the clone tool is something that you may or may not use however for now we'll just move on with the rest of these so the undo brush tool is something that you don't really need to worry about at this point either so we'll just skip over that one underneath that one we have our smudge brush tool and additional options inside of here as well so we'll start off with the blur brush tool this is good if you want to blur out certain parts of your image so if we just go over the eye over here you can see this started to blur out and this is kind of good if you want to maybe blur out the background just make your brush a bit bigger and start cutting around the image so it gives it that kind of bokeh effect as well as that we have the sharpen brush tool which generally just sharpens parts of the image so if we just do the lips and we go over that a few times that will start to sharpen that part of the image so these are generally tools that you may use quite often the smudge brush tool isn't something that i use often and may not be something that you will use so i won't cover that right now same as a medium brush tool the really main ones here are the sharpen and the blur so we just go ahead and move on so underneath that we have our in painting brush tool and we've got some additional options in here essentially they all kind of do the same thing but in different ways but the most important one is the in painting brush tool and we're going to talk about that in its own project in just a moment and why it is so great underneath that we have our red eye removal tool and this is something you may use often if you've got red eye in your images as for the rest of these you may not need to use those as long as you are using the impating brush tool which like i said we'll cover in just a moment so underneath that we have our pen tool and inside of here we have the node tool also and these work in conjunction with each other so generally the pen tool we're going to use in affinity photo for masking that's usually a good way of doing this it's a case of just clicking around the area you'd like to mask and you just got to start to bend that so the pen tool for beginners can be a bit overwhelming and i have made a separate tutorial on how to use a pen tool however that is inside of affinity designer but the same techniques are used across both of these softwares so if you do go ahead and learn it in affinity designer you can go ahead and copy that exact same technique over to affinity photo so once you've watched that video you'll be very confident in how to use this but just to quickly carry on i'm just going to just try and bend that around there very quick just to show you how this would generally work if we wanted to create a mask and then we just join that together just say we drew around the whole thing and then inside of that we could actually put another image and then use it as a clipping mask which we'll demonstrate later on down the line but for now we'll go ahead and grab the node tool and show you what that is for this is for generally creating extra points if we want to put them in there and moving it around to kind of make the shape a different shape or manipulate it a bit once again like i said i have covered both these different tools in that affinity designer tutorial so please go ahead and check that out in the top right hand corner now if you want to learn more about the pen tool but for now i'm just going to go ahead and delete that curve and we're going to move on so underneath this we have our shape building tools and we've got all different kinds of shapes inside of here so if we just go ahead and start with maybe this double star tool and we just drag this out and if you go ahead and hold down shift on your keyboard that will lock your proportions so it'll always stay perfect and on every single one of these shapes inside of here you'll find we have some additional options here on the top such as we can add additional points or we can change the inner radius as well as a point radius to make that rounded 
and every single tool will give you some different options up here so it's a case of just having a little play around with that so we'll just go ahead and delete that as well then underneath that one we have our text tools and we have two different options inside of here we have our artistic text tool and this is generally used if you want to create titles however if you want to go ahead and create a paragraph then you want to go and change that to the frame text tool and here you just draw yourself out a box and then you just start typing away inside of that box and that is generally all there is to it so i'll go ahead and delete those also then underneath that one we have our perspective tool as well as our mesh warp tool and this is kind of a way of manipulating images to bend them to a certain shape or fit them into maybe a photo frame or maybe you've got a flyer on the table that you need to change that perspective and with these it's just a case of selecting them and then just dragging down from the corners so you can see generally what that is doing so i'll let you go ahead and play with that yourself and it's the same thing if you do the same with the mesh tool just grab that from the corner and just have some additional handles here just try and reshape that what you are going for so once again just have a little play around with that one then finally we just got our magnifier glass which is just a way of zooming in and out which we'll do with this bar at the top here just by dragging that down or back up again or essentially you can change it here to a certain size percentage that you may want I don't generally use this as I tend to zoom in and out with the keyboard by using command or control plus or minus as well as command or control zero just to recenter that so that is a quick overview of all of our tools and what they are used for now we're going to go ahead and focus on the important ones I talked about and just do a couple of projects to show how they work so we're going to start off using the selection brush tool and then we'll go ahead and we will use the in painting brush tool where we're going to remove some objects from the image and then after that we'll talk about doing some masking using the paintbrush tool and then that should pretty much wrap it up in terms of learning the basics of affinity photo so we'll just go ahead now and get started on this next section so as i stated we're going to begin using this image right here of this wedding couple and once again i found this image on the stock section and i just searched wedding and that's how i come across that one if you want to go ahead and look for that yourselves so what we're going to do with this one is we're going to use a selection brush tool and we're going to cut these guys out away from this background and we're going to place it onto a new background as i'm sure that is what a lot of you people out there are aiming to already want to learn so just to quickly note before we begin this image has got really nice edges really sharp details so it's going to make it so much easier for us to cut this out whereas if you get an image of a bit more poor quality than this it may take additional work to get it as good however most of the time it's best just to try and work with decent images to begin with so to get started we're going to talk about these two different tools we've got up here the selection brush tool and the flood select tool so because this is completely blue in the background this is one of those situations where we could go ahead and grab that flood select tool and see if we can select all of this just by tapping on that so you can see generally what has gone on here is try to grab a majority of this blue and go around this the best it can it hasn't done a great job personally so this is not something that i'm going to use i'm actually going to command or control d to deselect that and then we're just going to start again using the selection brush tool which by far most of the time is a better tool anyway and all we got to do with this is we've got to increase our brush size with your left or right brackets on your keyboard to get that to a size you like then it's just a case of us tracing around this image so all we've got to really do is tap on our mouse and make that selection right there and then we just start dragging it down while holding our mouse button to try and get around this model and go all the way down to it wraps around the dress and we've got to make sure we get all the detail in here so you can see that line's gone down his shirt there but we want to actually get the rest of his suit in so we're going to try and focus on that as well get all those flowers in until you've managed to get everything into the selection that you are going for and it's always good to make your brush smaller or bigger at certain times like on this hair clip right there it's best to go for a smaller brush if we just use our right bracket key or left bracket keys to make them bigger or smaller we can just go over that to try and grab that also and also i want to grab these stray hairs around here and this is where this becomes really good in affinity photo in just a moment so we're just going to select over those don't worry that we've got loads of that blue in the background as we're going to let affinity work its magic and hopefully fix that for us in just a moment 
And the same with the loose hairs that we've got up here, just the strands that are flying around the place. These are the bits that make the photo look more realistic when you come to place it on a new background. It's going to undo that bit. Our selection is a little bit too big. So what we just basically done now is added a selection, whereas we want to subtract some of this, whereas inside of here and just down there. So to do that, we're going to come up to the mode section in the top left hand corner. And at the moment we've got add, so we want to change that to subtract. Then we're just going to come in here and start subtracting some of this blue there. You may want to make your brush a bit smaller as it does a better job and just click anywhere in the blue. And if you need to zoom in, then feel free to do that just to focus on these other areas. So we'll make that a little bit smaller again and try and grab that blue in there. Looking at the image, I actually want this piece of hair strand going down there in the image as well. So I'm going to come and bring that back just by getting my brush a bit bigger, changing it to the add and just drawing over that. Just going to undo that as it didn't do what I wanted it to do. So I'm just going to keep clicking here to try and get these hair strands in. And don't worry about it being messy. We are hopefully going to fix this in just a moment. So that should hopefully do on that bit. And then just going to make sure I add them little bits of hair in on his face there. Just like that. And then just got to focus on this area down here where we need to subtract that also. So we just go inside of here and just try to draw up there. Make that a little bit smaller. And we'll leave it like that. Don't worry too much about this section at the moment that's come off of the dress. We're going to fix that in just a moment. So what we're going to do now is zoom back out and we've made a pretty good selection here and this will work for what we are trying to do. Maybe if anything, I just want to bring those little strands of hair in at the back there. Just going to make that a little bit bigger just while I draw around her. And then that will be fine. So what we're going to do at this point, this is where the magic kind of happens in Affinity Photo. We're going to come up here to where it says refine on the top left hand side and we're going to hit that. So once we're inside of here, you can see the background has now changed to pink and that's kind of an overlay so we can see what it is that we're actually doing in here. So I'm going to zoom in now so you guys can see on your screen how this is working. And what we're going to do is just start painting around these areas that we've missed. And then Affinity is going to try its best to determine what is the background and what is the hair. And that will do a better job of separating that for us. So it's just a case of just going straight over there and then letting go. And then as you can see, that's done a really good job on that piece. And then we'll do the same here. So we come down there around the area, let go. And once again, that's done an absolutely brilliant job there as well. So we're going to make our brush a bit smaller while we focus on this area and just get inside of there. Once again, that's done a really great job. And then we've got this bit of stranded hair that we was talking about before. And we're just going to go over that one. Which isn't looking too bad. May have to go over it a couple of times to try and bring it back properly. And we'll just get rid of any additional pieces that we don't want. And just down inside there. So that's looking pretty good. And once again, we're just going to go around our head now. And the way I'm generally moving around like this is just using my mouse. I've got the magic mouse on my iMac and it just gives you the kind of invisible wheel built into the mouse where you can obviously move around. For some of you guys, you may just have to actually go and use the move tool, but you can also do that if you hold down the space bar and then you can just drag that around like that and then just let go of the space bar once you're ready to move on. So what I'm going to do now is make my brush a bit bigger again and we're going to focus on these areas that I need to clean up around here. So it's going to paint around there, make it a bit smaller just on a hair clip because I want to kind of get that in. And then we're just going to trace around that hair clip as well. And you can go ahead and do this all in one full sweep if you like, but I find it better always to work in sections. So we'll make that a bit bigger again on the brush. Try and get rid of all this blue and get these stray hairs in here. And just see how good of a job this will do. So as you can see, this is really easy and it's come a long way since I first started doing graphic design and photo editing. So at the moment, we're looking pretty good. We're just going to come down here now and address the little issue we've got down there with the dress disappearing. So all we've got to essentially do here is just paint this back in. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to come over to this panel we've got here, the refined selection, and we're going to change that from map to foreground. And then it's just a case of us just going back over this dress and trying to paint that back in the best you can. 
that's gone a little bit too far over there so i'm going to shrink the brush down this doesn't have to be perfect but you want to try and get some of that detail back in the dress so that will generally work i'm just going to zoom back out and that is our selection pretty much finished and we can easily work with that so just to quickly show you what else we can do here if you look at the preview menu right there where it says overlay we can change that to black so you can see how these guys would look on a black background you can also do that on a white background as well as black and white which is kind of like a silhouette effect or we can also go for transparent background so you can see how it looks when we come to export that to another image but for now i'm just going to put that back to overlay because that's how i like to work with it you've got some additional options in here by default you don't really have to mess around with those you can play around with them if you like but you can generally see it does a great job straight out using the default settings so what we need to do now is we've got to choose the way we want to output this so if we select on here we can either do this as a mask which is not what we want to do at this point a new layer is definitely what we should do i think because we're going to go ahead and move on to another background or you can also have a new layer with a mask attached but for this tutorial we're just going to go for the new layer and we're going to hit apply and now you can see over in our layer section we have the new layer as well as the old one so we can go ahead and turn the old one back on so the background's still there or if we just go ahead and turn that one off and back on you, you can see we've still got the original image here which remains the same as it always was so i'm just going to go ahead and turn that one off and put this one back on and all I'm going to do now is make a copy of this with Command or Control C. And then we're going to go ahead and find the background, which I've put in here already. Once again, I've got this in the stock section just by searching for snow. And that's how I found that one. So after going back onto the layers, we're just going to go ahead and paste that image inside of this one with Command or Control V. And there is our couple right there. So what I want to do before we begin is I want to crop this background as I feel it's going to be a little bit too wide for what I'm going for. So first of all, I'm just going to move my subjects to roughly where I want to put them. So maybe going to make them a little bit smaller, roughly around that size. And want a little bit of detail just around the background of them there. So something like that. And then I'm just going to go ahead and select that background image and I'm going to crop this. So I'm going to hit that crop tool. I'm going to bring this into the rough size that I'm happy with somewhere around there. Bring that over here, perhaps kind of make it more of a portrait style photo and just hit enter on that. And I'm quite happy with the way that looks. So what we generally got to do from here now is just start adding a few color effects just to kind of blend these guys in with the background. And then I think we're going to use a paintbrush tool to add a bit of snow overlay on this just to make it look that little bit more authentic. So what we want to do first is we're going to come down here to our adjustments and I think we're going to go for saturation perhaps on this first one just to bring those skin tones down a little bit and we're going to choose that by using the vibrance and we'll just go ahead and bring that saturation down just a little bit just to lighten them skin tones. So something like that is looking a little bit more realistic to me. So that looks pretty good for me at the moment. So as you'll notice over in our layers that this layer that we just created, which is the effect is now on the top of both of these. And this generally means that it's applying this effect globally, meaning the entire image. And we don't want to do that. We only want it to affect the couple themselves. So what we need to do is actually drag this down to get this big blue bar. And then we're going to pull it over slightly to the right till it shrinks. And then you're going to let go. And then that will nest that inside of this couple meaning it's only going to affect those and not the background itself. However, if you ever want to apply this to the entire image, just drag that back out and leave it on top. So what we can do now is come down to our adjustments and look for some other options that we have inside of here. So I'm not going to cover every single one of these as there's far too many of them. And it's a case of you guys just having a little play around with it and seeing what you can find that you like. But just another one I want to quickly show you, which is always a good one is selective color. So what we can generally do with this is we could target this blue suit, for instance, and try and change the color of that if you wanted to. So we're going to do that just by coming over to the color and we're going to focus on the blues. And then we're just going to mess around with these adjustments here. And you can see how we can start to change that. So it might look nicer in the color if we actually make this blue a little bit lighter. So we could just bring that down. Just like that. And just have a little play around with it and see what you can find that you like. It's only a bit of a subtle change, but for me, I think that looks better the way it was just now. Make that slightly lighter. 
and I'm quite happy with the way that looks. So already looking at this, it looks as though it's already taken in that photo anyway. So I'm quite happy with this, with the way it looks. If for any reason you chose a background that may have some sunshine in it or some darker areas, this is where you may want to come in with your dodge and burn just to create some highlights on the skin and some shadows. However, that will come with practice to make it brilliant, but it is pretty straightforward. So all I want to do on here now is we want to create some snow just to make it look that little bit more authentic. And then this project will be finished. And to do that, we're going to come over to our layers. We're going to select the top one of our couple and we're going to come down to the bottom here and we're going to create a new pixel layer. So if we add that pixel layer there, and this is the one that we're going to work on where we're going to add our snow. And to do that, we're just going to go over and grab our paintbrush tool. And then we head over to the right hand side where we have our brushes. And inside of here, I already have a snowfall and frost brush set, which I got from Google just by searching snow brushes for Photoshop or Affinity Photo. And you can download these for free. You will find absolutely hundreds of them, all different types of brushes, depending on what you are looking for. And all you got to generally do with these is select the one that you want. And then we just got to come over the image and we just got to simply lay it down by tapping anywhere we want to put it. And you can just make this bigger or smaller by adjusting your brush with your left or right bracket keys. But of course, I want this to be bigger than the canvas so it fills the screen. So something like that is perfectly fine. So once you've done that and you've tapped, that is what you are left with. I know this is black at the moment and we obviously want it white. So what we need to do is actually come in and change the blend mode of this. So if we select where it says normal and if we go down to something like maybe divide will do the job. Just like that, you can see it's now gone white. So that is already looking pretty good. You can also double up on this if you want to add even more snow in there. It's entirely up to you, which I generally think I might do just to make it look a bit more snowy. But what I want to do at this point is bring down the opacity just so it looks more authentic. So we just drag that down a little bit to something that you're happy with, something around maybe 40%. So it's kind of there, but it's subtle. And for me, I'm generally quite happy with that. That's something I'll generally be quite happy with as my first project. Of course, you can go in there and you can mess around with your adjustments to get your skin tones a little bit better and so on. But this is roughly how you would cut out an image and place it on a new background. So that is the first part of our tutorial finished on our first project. So quickly before we move on, I just want to point out that we didn't have to actually use these blend modes here to make this white. I did that because I forgot to change the color of the paintbrush. So if we go over to the color now, you can actually see that it's on black. So if I just go ahead and create another pixel layer and you can see it's black now on the screen. Whereas if I just changed that white to begin with, it would have just worked perfectly fine that way and I wouldn't have had to mess with the blend modes. Okay, so moving on, we're going to delete that pixel layer and this one is generally finished. We're now going to move on to the next part of our tutorial. And this is where we are going to use our in painting brush tool. And we're going to use this to remove all these objects from this background. So if we first of all start off by grabbing the painting brush tool, we can just begin and get rid of some of this stuff. So all we generally got to do with this is make our brush size big enough to cover the objects such as this one here and just start painting over it. So once we start painting over it, try and get all of this in and just back up again and all the way around there. And then once you finish, just let go of that. And then you can see Affinity will do a really good job of just removing that. That was so quick and easy and it used to be so much harder than this. So now it's just a case of going around the cup as well. And then we just get rid of that one. So make sure we cover all of it. And the way this generally works is Affinity tries to sample all of the area outside of this image and just replicate it. So it makes it look as though it was never there. So once I let go of that one, we can see that's done a really good job there as well. And if you find any areas that you don't like that you may want to change, such as this transition between there and there, just make a bit of a smaller brush and just Go over it a little bit, just try and blend that in a little bit better to what it is you're going for. And then we'll just go ahead and do the same thing up here with the keyboard. So this is why I said you don't generally need to use a clone brush tool anymore. There's easier ways of doing this. And we're just going to paint around that as well. Make my brush bigger while I go over this. Make sure I cover all of that, let it go and see how good of a job that will do. And we've got a bit of rough area just over here. But like I said, if we just continue just to paint over that, try and blend it in to make it look more authentic then you wouldn't generally know that they was ever there. So if we just zoom out a little bit, it just actually looks like a floor or a table. So that is the in painting brush tool and how great that is for removing objects from a photo. 
So I think finally, before we wrap this up, we're going to talk about masking and we're going to do that with a project which is called the double exposure effect. And that is where we'll combine two images together to make one composition. So we're just going to go ahead now and get started on that one. OK, so I've just opened up a new project while we talk about masking. So when people refer to masking, there are two different types that we can do. One is a clipping mask. And what a clipping mask is, is a way of us putting an image inside of a certain shape. And I can demonstrate that just by coming down to our shape building tools here and maybe selecting the rounded rectangle. And just going to draw that out to any size that you want. So if we want to put an image inside of here now, what it will do is act as a clipping mask, meaning it can't come outside of this shape and it will follow all those curves. So if we just go over to the right hand side in the stock section and just select anything that we want to use just to preview this, maybe that one there. Let's drag that over into the canvas. And most of the time when you drag these in, they are going to be far too big. So you may just have to zoom out and resize those. So if you grab that move tool and just drag those corners in and get that more to a size you're happy with and then you can work with. And then just zoom back in with command and control zero. So what we need to do now is just go over to our layers and you can see there is our rectangle that we just created. And if we want to now bring this inside of here, all we've got to do is just drag it and pull it down to that big blue bar take it over to the right slightly so that big blue bar shrinks and then just drop it in. And now you can see it's masked inside of this and this is what you would call a clipping mask. So once we tap on the rounded rectangle, we can generally move that as a whole anywhere around that you like. If for any reason you want to resize or move the image inside of that, we just got to select the image itself and then we can just move that around inside of the shape as well as make that bigger or smaller. That is generally how you would create a clipping mask. Or alternatively, if you didn't want to use one of these custom shapes, we could make our own. And that is the reason we got those Polaroids right here in the background. And the way we're going to do this is we're just going to use that pen tool. So if we go and select that, and all we've got to generally do is find the corners of the black area and just draw around there. So if we find our first one right there, come down to the bottom left hand corner, put another point there and just make your way around the image until you've got the shape that you are happy with and just join those together. And now, as you can see in our layers, we have our curve and we're just going to rename that box. So this isn't perfect. As you can see, there's a bit of white there, but it is really just to quickly demonstrate how you would do this. So then it's exactly the same principle that we did before. Maybe just dragging that image is probably too big yet again. So we have to shrink that down. So we just pull that in itself, make it big enough to fit the image, but not too big. And then we we'll zoom back in again, back over to our layers. And once again, just bring that down to that big blue bar appears and drag it over to the right till it shrinks and drop it in. And because we're on this image itself, we can now move this where we want to put it as well as resize that as well as rotate it. If you wanted to kind of match up that Polaroid position. So you can see how easy that actually was. And if for any reason you're not happy with the way you've made these lines, like we've still got the black there, we can actually come in and edit that and make it better. So if we click back on that curve and we go now to our node tool, we can come down and we can move this. So if we just zoom in and then make our way over to the left hand side, if we select that point, we can just go ahead and pull that down and just cover up any bits that we didn't do properly. So that is how easy that is to actually fix. And now we've actually got this one. We could go ahead and copy this and put it across the other two. So if we just command C and command V or control C and control V on the windows, we can just move this over. We've got just got to rotate it to kind of match up that side or you can manually draw around it again. It's entirely up to you. Maybe rotate that just a little bit more, but this time all we've got to generally do is just delete that image and bring in a different one instead. So we go back to the stock and we'll maybe find a different one. Maybe that family right there. And once again, just shrink that image. This does become a pain. Bring that down to about that size, zoom back in again with control or command zero back to our layers and then drag that one back into that other box. And then once again, we can move that into position, rotate that around. And if you like, make it smaller and do whatever it is you want to do with that. So that is a custom way of creating clipping masks. OK, so what I'm going to do next is talk to you about the other way of masking. And we're going to do that by duplicating this Polaroid here on the right hand side. And I'm going to try and put it behind these two here. But I'm just going to go ahead and remove these images for the moment as I don't need them. So we'll go ahead and grab our selection brush tool 
And we're just going to start drawing around here just to try and select it so we can cut out in just a moment. And just like before, we're just going to make sure we get all that content in that we actually want to keep. So all this white and black area. And don't worry about it over spilling on the sides. We're going to fix that by refining that in just a moment. So we'll hit that refine button and just clean up those edges right there and see if there's anything else we missed, such as that piece. This doesn't have to be perfect. It's literally just to show you how this works quickly. And once you're happy with that, just go down to your output, change that to new layer and hit apply. So that's turned off the original one because it's made a copy. So we're going to go ahead and turn that back on again and recenter that with command or control zero. Then we're going to go over and grab our move tool and we'll just select that one that we just created and move it over into place and rotate that. So the idea here is to get this to sit behind both of these other ones in the background. And like I said, don't worry about all this on the side here where it doesn't look perfect. It's just a quick tutorial on how this works. We're going to actually use it in a real project in just a moment. But with this method of masking, we need to come over and make sure that we are on the layer that we want to affect. And then we're going to come down here to the bottom and we're going to select that mask layer. So once you click on that, you'll see we've got this white box underneath it, which becomes our mask. And the way you would use a mask is with the paintbrush tool. So if we go over and we select that paintbrush, and we can just begin by getting started with this. So the thing to remember with masking is you've got two different colors that you need to remember how they work. So black is what is going to make something disappear and white is what's going to bring it back. So at the moment, if you look on the right hand side, we are on black. So that essentially, if I start painting over this, it's going to make it disappear. So I just quickly go over that a few times just to fade that out. And you can see now the image on top of it is overlapping the one that we just put in. And this is generally how you'd get this to work. You've got to be a little bit more precise and careful around these edges just to get it perfect, but that comes with practice. So that generally is what happens when you use a black, it will just start to paint it away. Whereas if we come up now and we change this to white and we paint back over it, it's actually going to bring it back just like that. So it's kind of non-destructive. You can always come back and forth if you didn't get the effect that you were going for. We also have additional options up here, such as the opacity or hardness. And these settings are dependent on what it is you're trying to achieve at the time of creating your art, whether you want a harder brush edge or a softer brush edge, or whether you want it to be darker or lighter. But we'll talk more about that as we go on with the next project. But a good general tip, if you are trying to get these edges to be perfect around here, all you want to actually do is just drop the opacity on that layer that we just created so we can see through it temporarily. And then you can just start painting around that and then bring that opacity back up after. So one thing you need to remember is that you are always on the mask layer when you come to painting this. If you start doing it on that layer on top, it's just going to start painting randomly black, as you can see, and that's not going to do what you want it to do. So it's going to command and Z or control Z to undo that and it will select that mask layer. And then we can just go ahead and start cutting this out again by painting over it. And then you can make your brush bigger or smaller just to get around these more complex areas. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just want to really show you how it does work. So I don't want to make it perfect. I'm just going to be quick and easy with this. It's not going to be great at all, but I'm just going to bring that opacity back up so you can see generally how it did work. And you would do the same thing with this one over here as well by clicking back on that mask and just start painting over that one. And then you can paint away that one. And this is generally how you will overlap objects in the background over the one that you put down yourself. So I hope that makes sense to you how this generally does work. It's pretty straightforward. Just remember that black conceals and white reveals. And if you ever go wrong, you can always change that color back to white and paint things back in that you didn't mean to make your brush bigger then just get it all back to how you originally started. So with that said and done, we are now actually going to move on to the next project so I can show you how we would use this in a double exposure effect. Okay, so just like before, I've opened up a new project to speed the video up a bit quicker. And what we want to do now is just bring in a couple of images that we're going to combine together. And we would do that by going up to the file menu on the top left hand side, go down to where it says place. Then once we hit that place, it's going to direct us to your hard drive. And inside of here, you just got to go and find the location to where your images may be saved. So for all of you who want to follow along with all the projects I've done in this tutorial, then I will link these images in the description for you to download. 
But for this project, I just want to select this girl and this city. So I'm going to select both of those and press open. And then it's just a case of dragging this out. The first one there to the size of the canvas, that'll be fine. And then after that one's laid itself down, you can then begin drawing out the next one and make that as big as you like as well. Once again, I want that to be roughly the same size as a canvas as well. So it covers the image. And then it's going to go ahead and recenter that with Commander Control Zero. And go and move that one roughly over there somewhere. I'll worry about the city in just a moment. But for now, I'm going to turn that off because I want to focus on the girl underneath. So the idea from here is we want to put the city inside of her and basically blend out certain parts of her face so it looks really artistic. And what we need to do first is just generally cut her out. So just like before, we're going to grab our selection brush tool. And one thing I need to mention that I didn't mention before is we want to make sure we've always got snap to edges turned on as this is what generally helps it work around the edges and helps it be more precise. So once we're ready to begin, we're just going to start drawing around here like we did before. This doesn't have to be perfect. Just try and get it as good as you can. We can always refine it and hopefully it'll do a better job for us. So it's just a case of getting in all the areas that we know we do want. I'm going to go a bit more rough around the hair because I want some of these stray hair pieces coming off it. I just had to undo that because it made it too big. I'm just going to try and manage that a little bit better. And go around that some more. And that's looking OK. I'm just going to get that shoulder in there. I'm going to get this hand over there and that area. Make my brush a bit smaller just to focus in on this hand. And that, that nail right there. I'm just going to go and get those hairs in there as well. And hopefully the refining it will fix that for us. And these nails over here. I'm not going to make it 100% perfect as this is really just to demonstrate how it works. But you guys can spend a lot more time on this if you wanted to. So for me, that will do just to demonstrate. So we'll go ahead and hit that refine button once again. And then we're just going to go ahead and paint around the image just to try and get it to look better. So we'll start off in sections rather than doing it as a whole, as that generally I feel is the best way to work. So just down there like that. Go around the fingers. And like I said, this won't be perfect as I want to be a little bit quicker at this point, as I imagine we're approaching at least an hour into the video now. And I don't want to spend too much of your time on this. So it's a case of keep going around it until we've got all the areas that we know that we don't want to keep. And then just let that go around that ear a little bit more and that finger. And that isn't looking too bad. It could be better. But like I said, I just want to be a little bit quicker. I'm not going to worry about that blue in there. I'm just going to leave that for the time being. So once you're happy with your selection, we're just going to come down to the output like we did before. And we'll select that as a new layer and hit that apply button. And just like before, it's isolated the one we just cut out and turned off the layer underneath it. We don't generally need the layer underneath it. So you can go ahead and delete that if you want. However, if you want to keep that in case you mess up this one, go ahead. But what I want to do next is actually draw a background on here. And we're just going to do that by grabbing ourselves a rectangle. And we'll just draw that straight over the canvas. And I'm going to give that a color of black. And I'm just going to make sure that is behind her. And I'm just going to enlarge it just to make it fit the canvas. And we can always come in and change the color of this later. I'm just going to leave it black for the moment. So what we're actually going to do now is we're going to use her as a clipping mask because we've cut around her. It's generally just like using one of the shapes we did earlier. We just now got to drag the city down inside of her. Just wait for that big blue bar, pull it over to the right to the strength and then let it go. And then once we turn that image back on underneath, we'll be able to see that through her. So she's kind of silhouetted out now and we've got that image in the background and we can go ahead and grab that move tool and just position this to however you want it to be. You may want that to be bigger. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit as I kind of want those buildings in the background to be the vocal point of this. So maybe somewhere like that will be fine. So I'm going to zoom back in. And just like we did before, we're going to put a mask now on this layer so we can start hiding bits of that and bringing back the original image. So we're just going to come down here and we're going to put that new add mask layer on there. And make sure we are selected on that mask. Go ahead and grab yourself that paintbrush tool. And remember exactly what I said about the colors, that the black is going to make this color disappear and bring back the original image, whereas white will bring this one back. So before we do that, we're just going to go over to our brushes and ensure that we are on the brush that we want to use. 
As I stated before, you will find plenty of brushes for free on Google by just searching paint brushes for Affinity Photo or Photoshop. But what we need for this tutorial is just inside this basic section, which is by default inside of your Affinity Photo when you first purchase that. And I'm just going to go down to the very bottom and I'm going to select that soft brush right there. And I'm just going to go ahead and make sure I'm on the color black. And I'm going to change my opacity up here to around maybe 75%. So what I basically want to do here is just be able to see the girl when I paint over it. So I can focus on the areas that I want to keep and the areas that I don't. So if we just draw her back in quickly, but you can generally see now it's already combined both these images together. And first of all, I'm going to focus on the bits that I do want to keep. I want to keep these hands here. I don't want the image visible on the hands. So I'm going to actually go up to the hardness. I'm going to change that all the way to the top. So the brush is hard and not soft. And I'm just going to paint straight over these pieces here. And if I put that on 100% opacity as well, that's going to make it a lot easier in terms of going over it so many times. And I'm just going to shrink my brush down a little bit and just start to paint this back in on the areas that I know I want to keep. And the same with this hand over here. So I can just happily go straight over and start painting in the arm as well. And this is a creative decision. It's entirely up to you how you would actually like to design this. Just have a little play around and see what it is that you can achieve. And if you don't like anything, just paint it back in by simply changing that back to white like I showed you before. But you can generally see how easy this technique really is. So I'm nearly done with the hands. I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger and always adjust your brush as you're painting. And it's just that final piece right there, the arm, which if I just get that bit out there and just on that thumb, and then my hand should generally be complete and I can continue with the rest of the image. So it can be a bit time consuming in terms of how complex you want it to look. So for me, that is looking fairly good at the moment. And with this blue bit in here, if I just zoom in quickly, if I just go ahead and put a mask on her in a moment, we can actually erase it so it shows a black underneath. But I'm not too worried about that for now. So let's just carry on with this for a moment. So what is important is you always want to remember to keep the important details, such as the eyes and the lips and a bit of the nose. You want to be able to distinguish what the image actually is as well as the image underneath that. So with keeping my hardness at 100 and my opacity at 100, I'm actually just going to go ahead and draw this hair back in at the top. And just get close to the edge on this and always do this on the areas that you know you are adamant on keeping. So I'm just going to go over that. And like I said, if you bring out too much, you can always go back in with the white and paint it back in, which is what I'm going to do around this area in just a moment. I just want to make sure I can get all these bits in that I actually want to keep. And sometimes you may want to zoom in just to remove certain bits that you're not happy with. So at this point, I'm going to bring these eyes back in. So I'm going to drop that opacity down to probably around 70%. And I'm going to bring that hardness back down now. So it gives me a soft brush. I'm just going to make the brush bigger and start painting these eyes back in. And just go over these a few times just so we can actually see that's one of the facial features. I don't want to be able to see any of the image in the background through the eyes. And you can do this depending on how you're happy with it. Just a case of going over it a few times and seeing if you are happy with the end result. If not, just keep going over that. So that's not looking too bad on the eyes. It's going to go around the bottom edge a little bit. Just give it a bit of dimension around there. I'm going to do the same thing with the nose just at the bottom here. Just paint that back in so we can see just the detail there in the nose. And I'm going to do the same with the lips. I want to make sure I can't see through the lips. So I'm going to go over that a few times as well. And because the opacity is quite low at 70%, you're going to have to go over this a number of times unless you want to change that just to speed things up. But I'm just going to keep it the way it is at the moment just to quickly demonstrate this. So let's go over there a number of times and you could always go in there and make that even better yourself. So that isn't looking too bad at the moment. I just want to create a little bit around the nose there so I can kind of see the shape of it. And of course, if you feel like the image in the background is too bright, you can bring that opacity back down again just to fade that out even more, maybe around 25%. Make our brush a lot bigger. And then we can just go over the entire image and just fade that out a little bit more. So it just looks a little bit more natural. Kind of like that. And then, like I said, if we now go over to changing the color to white, we can start painting in the areas that we didn't actually want to get rid of, such as this part here. We can just start going back over that there and paint that back in. 
and of course change your hardness and softness etc that bottom lip there i know isn't perfect so i just want to change that again and get that to look better than it does so i'm just going to make the brush a little bit smaller and i'm just going to start painting this back in again just around this bottom edge i'm being a little bit too precise in this when i really should be focused on spending less time just to get you guys finished okay so i'm going to zoom back out and what else I want to do is I want to make sure I am back on black so I can start removing some of this again. And I want to kind of give it a halo effect on the back so we can distinguish that this is skin rather than the image. So I'm going to make that brush a bit bigger. I'm going to bring that opacity back up to around 70. And I'm going to bring that hardness back down again. And I'm just going to start to just draw over the edge of this just to bring a bit of that skin in and fade that image into it. And just go over that a few times just to see if it looks better and already that is definitely looking better to me i don't know what you guys think but i'm quite happy with the way that is looking right now and another thing is i kind of want to soften up this area around the neck there so it just doesn't look like it's going straight into the face maybe just add a bit of dimension then maybe give a halo effect kind of around the chin as well so first of all let's just drop our opacity again maybe down to 35 and I'm just going to start softening this part on the neck just to make it a little bit lighter just so it doesn't stand out as much compared to the face but still have it there so I think something like that is looking okay if we just zoom out a little bit that isn't too bad if you do too much you can always bring it back just by changing the color to white so if we just go ahead now and bring this opacity back up again to around 70 like we did before I'm just going to go and do around the face here, make my brush a bit smaller and just start working my way around here just to kind of give that halo effect or 3D dimension to the chin. And you can go over this as many times as you like. So that is not looking too bad at all. This could be so much better if you use a better image, but this doesn't look too bad for a quick demonstration. So you could always bring in this detail back down there as well if you want to bring in that line there that goes under her arm you can always paint over that a few times that's entirely up to you just so you can see the difference between the two arms against the skin and just fix any parts that you may have missed such as on the arm there i can just paint that back in as well so it's a quick demonstration i'm quite happy with that there could be a lot more to be done on this but it's basically finished but i definitely urge you guys to spend more time on it and make it better so what we're going to do now is we're going to click on the girl herself which is that top pixel layer and we're going to add a mask to her now. So if we go back down and we go onto the new mask layer and we make sure we select that one, what we can do now is we can blend our hair into the background just by making our brush bigger, making sure that we are on the color black again. As you remember, that black conceals and white will reveal. And we just got a case of going over a hair and just start blending that into the background if you want to. You don't have to, it's entirely up to you. This is kind of just a last minute artistic choice just to kind of make it look a bit more authentic, like she's blended into the background. Let's go over that a few times. You can obviously soften your brush and so on if you want to. And just get in that area there, just make this a bit darker there on the stray hairs. Same over there. And that isn't looking too bad. I can work with that just to try and finish this off. So essentially at this point, you could actually turn off that background and put this on a whole different background if you wanted to and maybe blend it into that background. That choice is completely yours. Or additionally, if we go up to our layers and we go down to our new live filter layers, we've got some options in here such as lighting. So if we turn on that lighting, this actually gives us an option to make an artificial light if you wanted to. Kind of make it look more like a portrait and just move that into place and just kind of get the kind of effect that you're going for if you want to be darker on one side and lighter on the other and it's just a case of having a little mess around with that and seeing what you can generally do but in my opinion that doesn't look too bad at the moment although i haven't had time to go over every single feature inside of affinity photo there are just a couple of things to note these adjustments up here are generally the same as what we've got down here in the adjustments menu however these are automatic these are based on what Affinity Photo feels that the photo will need. They're not always correct, but feel free to have a little play around with them if you like. This is just your way of deselecting and selecting and inverting your selections. And over here, 
The important one here really is just to have snapping turned on if you're trying to align anything perfectly. And then this section over here are really just to do with your layers and how you'd like to position them, whether you want some of these in front or behind others, as well as in your live filter menu. You've got some various different effects in here. I'm sorry I didn't have time to cover all of this, but I generally didn't want you guys sitting here for too long. But I'm definitely a strong believer in your learn by doing. So just go ahead and get stuck in and do a few of the things that we've learned today. And then just go and check out some more YouTube videos, either by myself with my playlist for Affinity Photo, where I've done various different projects that you can learn from. And I will link that in the right hand corner right now, as well as check out any other playlists I have on Affinity Designer, for instance, where I'll show you how to create vector art. So if you enjoyed today's video, then please give me a thumbs up as it really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm and helps other people see my content. And of course, if you haven't already, then please hit that subscribe button and check out all the other content I currently have available as any future releases. So at the time of this video, I've just hit a thousand subscribers. So I just want to say thank you to every one of you guys who have stuck with me through this long and have gave me such great feedback and liked my videos. And if you know anybody who may find this video helpful, then please feel free to share that to them as it helps me out also. So for now, enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you in the next video.